All right, well, I guess we can just go ahead and get started. Okay. So I'm going to start by saying thank you. This is Behind the Book with J. Diane Dotson, and we'll be discussing her Questrizon saga. Am I saying that right? Questrizon. Questrizon saga, yes. And um, so to start off, um, what got you interested in writing? Well, I've always written ever since I was a young kid. Uh, before I ever wrote science fiction, I was writing stories. I was illustrating them. Some of them were nice and preposterous. Some of them were comics. I wrote a comic about the blob, except I made it Son of Blob, which was a funny comic because I was kind of having trouble with the movie. So I wanted to make it humorous somehow. And so then I had this Son of Blob comic that basically talked about how it morphed in all different shapes all the time. Didn't eat anybody. So, and you know, I kind of went from there and wrote little dramas and things like that. And then I decided one day that, you know, I really wanted my own space opera after having seen Star Wars at age three. That was the first time I had seen it. And it basically shaped my life from then on. I also had watched a lot of Star Trek and Lost in Space and other things like that as a young kid. And then, you know, the 80s, once the 80s really got rolling, I was all into like He-Man, Transformers, She-Ra, Jim and the Holograms and all those things. And I was also a major Oz book fan. And while I had loved the movie as a little kid, the Oz books by L. Frank Baum were what I really fell in love with. And I, I really dug into those original 14 books and that shaped a lot of my writing too. And there's a lot of Oz references in Luminiferous too, kind of tucked here and there. So that was, that was kind of what started. And I was always writing, I was writing a lot of poetry in school and I was always, you know, the biggest nerd in the class that was also a girl. So I was, I kind of was just making my own world because I didn't really feel like I fit in with everybody else there. I think the internet has allowed us to realize that there's a lot more girls like us. I know, and it's great, right? <laughs> yes. It's a whole different <laughs> universe, literally. So that was, you know, I, I tried to convert a lot of my friends to being nerds, showed yeah. them aliens at slumber parties and made them scream <laughs> and things like that. That <laughs> so was great. Very cool. Um, so what does your writing process look like? So a lot of people talk about plotting versus pantsing, that kind of thing. And I don't have like outlines, everything's in my head, but I do follow the structure of that. And in terms of this particular saga, the Questrazon saga, I've been writing it for decades off and on and redoing it and reshaping it. So I always knew the end game and I basically wrote toward that end game and what I knew was going to happen. And in terms of actually just sitting down, I usually type on a computer, although if I'm away from one and I don't wanna do it on my phone, then I'll just use pen and paper. I'll use whatever I have on hand. And I, that's how I started, because I was a terrible typist. So <laughs> I'm, I'm faster now. I can't say that I'm better, but thank you for, you know, spelling checks. And so I would say that, you know, I, I think of the plot, I think of the characters, it's the characters that drive the plot, not the characters, it doesn't really matter, you know, you've got to care about them and, and what's going on with them. So I, I just get it down on the page. I don't worry about editing as I go, per se. Sometimes I'll give a little edits, which my editors have kind of trained me to do over the years. Uh, but, you know, I, I just emphasize, get it down, get it on the page worry about that stuff later. There's people who edit for a reason and it's their whole life. You know, you can't get too caught up in it because it'll stymie you from finishing your book. And the idea is to finish it and get it out there, you know, and it, it will be going through multiple edits of your own and others. So that's kind of my process. And I also like to keep a little drawer of chocolate <laughs> by my side. Always a solid plan. Yes, it is. And it works. <laughs> And so what, what inspired you to write this specific series? So I had mentioned that I had seen Star Wars at a young age and I really loved Star Wars. I loved Dune, which I read later when I was probably about 15. Um, I just really wanted a, a really strong woman character, multiple women characters. And I dove into that, even though the main character of Heliopause is Forster and he's a guy, you know, he, his life is shaped by the stone of an alien woman that he hasn't met, Galadea, who gets her debut in the second book. He briefly sees something of her in Heliopause and just a hint of who she is. And so, but I just really wanted to have my own space opera. I didn't see what I wanted for myself, so I made it. 
you know, and that's where the Questrion saga came in. And, and I really wanted it to be both fun and serious. I didn't want it to be dark and gritty. You know, I wanted it to have moments where you, you definitely felt afraid for the characters in the galaxy, but I also wanted it to have some elements of fun and just, you know, I wanted it to be sexier as mm -hmm. an adult, right? Yeah. Not when I was a kid writing this, but as an adult, <laughs> I was like, it needs to be a little sexier than Star Wars. And mm -hmm. I need my characters to be good and flawed. And, you know, I didn't, you know, Luke Skywalker, he goes through this journey of being this kind of dopey farm boy to being yeah. sort of a Zen master. That doesn't really happen with my characters. You know, <laughs> they are who they are. You know, they do go through changes and they realize their mistakes, but they're still the same people with their flaws and their passions and their, you know, their weaknesses. And so I wanted to keep that that way as well. You know, it's a hero's journey doesn't mean that the hero has to completely change, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, it works in some sense situations, but that's not what I wanted for my saga. You don't need someone who's just a pure archetype, you know, <laughs> for the right. hero's journey. Yeah. I like complicated people. Mm -hmm. I'm a complicated person. I think most people are. And, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't like to sugarcoat things. I, you know, I, one thing that I liked is the character Ariel realizing how badly she messed up and it mm -hmm. was, you know, it's too late, you know, she couldn't fix it. So, you know, these kinds of things, you know, you have prices to pay and, you know, it's not all hunky dory at the end of the day. And even, even if you think that there's a victory, there's always a shadow behind you or something over your shoulder that you're going to be looking for. So, which is kind of like real life. Yeah. I mean, it, can't, it, can't work out per it can't work out perfectly for everybody, which certainly, no, not, no spoilers, but the third book, yeah, things don't always work out perfectly. <laughs> yeah, I, I really brought out the long knives in a creation. And um, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, this is the first book, Heliopause, mm -hmm. for readers to see. The second book, things get much more exotic and ephemeris. Mm -hmm. In accretion, yeah, I don't hold back. There was some George R. R. Martin stuff going on. It brought out the knives. And then of course the <laughs> yeah. last one was Nephris. And yeah, so I, I knew always that this was going to happen. When I first had written, you know, this the early versions of this, the first book that I ever wrote was like an early version of what was happening in Luminiferous. Um, so I always knew what certain characters' fates were gonna be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the problem is, is that I got older and I, I love those characters so much that it was hard to do this to them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you felt like you knew them and you're like, oh God, I just really, uh, you know, it was really hard because I was going through a lot emotionally while writing Accretion in 2019, oh. you can tell. So <laughs> you know, I definitely wove it in and then Luminiferous was again, also very hard. I'd lost my father and, you know, I'm not gonna spoil it, but, there were things that were already written and it just happened to be coinciding with my own grief. So yeah. you see that too. And, uh, and the journey there. So it's just, you know, yeah, I, yeah. Martin, uh, Martin should look at me. At least I finished yeah. my series. I finished my series. Yes. Yes, you did. <laughs> I know. Caddy, like, but you know, you know that, George, <laughs> right. Cause I, you know, and I just felt like what, what point is it if you don't think the stakes are real. So, mm -hmm. And the stakes were very real for these characters and destroyed lives. So, and that the repair for that isn't an overnight thing, you know, it's yeah. going to take time. You can't so. just have some deus ex machina come in and, you know, fix everything, you know? Right. And even if you think it's fixed, there's, there's shadows of what's left and mm -hmm. that's going to be a problem, you know? So the story is, the saga is over, the story's not. Right. Yeah. So how do you approach world building in a sci-fi setting? Well, I draw from a few different things. I've always had a vivid imagination and I always wanted to escape. You know, I grew up mostly, um, and I was born in Kingsport and I grew up mostly in gray. And even though I loved being outside like most hours of the day, there were, there were certain aspects of my life that I wanted to get away from. And so I started to write these worlds and I don't even remember how I started to do that. You know, I've read a lot of science fiction and fantasy and um, I felt like, how do I make this place real? Well, you learn to do things like talk about how a place smells and the details like chips in the paint, things like that. But at the same time, if you're looking at the grander scope of the galaxy, I like planets that, you know, look like they could be planets that we know already or that are completely exotic. And my science education helped with that because I had a degree in ecology and in 
evolutionary biology. So I kind of drew on that in my science writing, which is what I do during the day to, in, you know, influence the world building a bit. Yeah, I, I got a sense of that, you know, space felt very real, you know, in these books. That's um, great. That's yeah. The idea. And so I'll, I'll, alternately, you've got the characters. So how do you develop your characters and the relationships with one another? Well, I like to think that I know them or that I've interacted with them in some way. And, you know, I basically put myself in their shoes and go from there, you know, and the characters, like some of them draw from me or people that I've known. There's not one like that's, oh, that's me. You know, Forster's right. got a lot of me. Gala's got a lot of me. Ariad does too. Uh, and, you know, and they're all flawed and they've had dramatic histories and so have I. So, you know, and I just feel like the point is you want the story to move forward, but you want the characters to be in the story. So inventing those characters is just some of them kind of run away from you and grow on their own and you don't know what they're going to do next. But others, you know, have been in my brain for so many years. Ariad, I had dreamed of mm -hmm. when I was about 13, back in 1987, when I was first writing this, like very vivid dream of this guy, kind of like a Brit rock alien, um, nice. took, me, took me up into the sky to his sky palace. And there actually is an excerpt directly from that dream in Ephemeris where, you know, he's taking Gal around saying, these are our children, you know, and, you know, that was just so incredibly vivid. So I do have vivid dreams, but mostly I just let my imagination run wild and see what these characters do and put them in bad situations and see if they can yeah. get out of them or not. <laughs> so speaking of that, did, did this series take the path you expected or did it surprise you? It did surprise me because when I first wrote it, I wrote a full book that my English teacher actually looked into submitting for me at age 14. Oh, wow. And most, much of that plot is the final book, Luminiferous. And I went, but I wrote a sequel too, another complete book. And, uh, you know, life happens and you grow up, you know, so she had contacted publishing companies on my behalf. And one of them wrote back Berkeley Publishing Group, which I think is with Penguin now, I'm not sure. But they said, you know, if you're wanting to submit, here's the guidelines, but you are very young. So you might want to hone your craft, things like that. So High school came along, I kind of got distracted by that and college and relationships and things like that and jobs and I was exhausted all the time. And, uh, you know, it kind of took a back burner, but I was still writing, rewriting it, writing stories related to it, things like that. Much of what is now ephemeris, I wrote when I briefly lived in San Francisco in 2005. And when I was writing that, I thought, well, I need to tell how they got there. How did the humans get out there? So there came heliopause and here I am dreaming again, sort of in between wakefulness and dreaming. And I see this guy walking down this hallway and his feet are sinking into these weird floors and these dim lights. And he's like, God, here I go again. What am I gonna do this time? You know, frustrated with his life, that was Forster. So then I thought he's, he's the guy that's gonna connect all of this together. You know, he's who I've been waiting for to show up. So yeah, I wasn't expecting Forster to show up. You know, I, I knew about Cain but now I knew about Forster and he was just whole cloth. There he was. And I ran with that. And then the people that he knew. So yeah, it took some turns. And then I, I had a, a journey in which I originally thought I probably wanted to publish it myself. Then I was encouraged by traditionally published authors to query. So I did that and went through that process for a long time. And then I came very close with five agents and had full manuscript requests and things like that. But, you know, it was a situation of what they wanted wasn't what I wanted. And I had been with this series for so long that I thought, you know, I don't want to kill off all these people in Heliopause. That's what a creation is for. Yeah. So <laughs> that was one of the agents things. So, um, you know, I, I thought the time is now, you know, I can hire professional editors. I can hire professional designers. And Ingram Spark is like worldwide distribution. I did not want to just, as one of my editors said, slap it on Amazon, which is yeah. fine, but that wasn't what I wanted. And the reason was because I wanted it to be an independent bookstores mm -hmm. or any bookstore. And you can't do that with Amazon because right. it's their direct competitor. And so I was really happy that things kind of aligned the way they were. I had a friend of mine who said, you need to finish it, get it out there. I did that and, you know, I've, 
I've worked really hard to promote it. It's a lot of work, but it's been for me worth it. It wouldn't be for a lot of people and everything that I write from here on out, except for the anthology, I likely will submit to agents and try to get traditionally published because mm -hmm. it's a lot of work and yeah. it costs a lot of money. And I would like for somebody else to kind of take that wheel. I know we still have to promote no matter what kind of author we are, but it's just a lot more comforting to know that it, a lot of stuff would be out of my hands, you mm -hmm. know, but for the series, I very much, it was my baby, my first baby. Yeah. And what a baby it is. It's a wonderful baby. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, and um, what, what do you want the reader to take away from this story? Well, it's quite the journey. And one of the things that, that I decided with the titles, which were all kind of space related on some level, I wanted them in the end to spell something out. And so they spell heal. And I wanted people to know that you can go through a lot of things in life and still make meaningful connections and you can heal and you can grow and no matter what the galaxy throws at you. So that was one thing that I wanted to get across is that these are, this is science fiction fantasy. It's a space opera. You're gonna have humans, aliens, telepathic ability, androids, really cool space foxes. They're called Dean Gynes, you know, yes. mages. It's all kinds of wonderful spacecraft and giant structures and things like that. But it's really about, you know, who are you at the end of the day and what do you stand for and what do you do when everything's against you and who do you go to when you need to be healed you know because that's another part of life that for me had been really hard to accept is just to ask for what i needed and wanted from life and you know a pairs of the heart or otherwise it's like you really have to put that out there in the universe you know that that's what you want and so it's all about family and healing and friendship in the end you know, and I think I think a lot of those themes you find in sci-fi. I mean, especially you look at Star Trek. Talk about looking at ethics and and the human emotions and the human yes. heart and all that stuff. You know, just all kinds of moral quandaries. You know, more than just aliens and spaceships, really. Right. Um, and uh, what did you learn when writing this series? I learned that I wasn't as alone as I thought. That there are a lot of writers out there like me who have big dreams and they've persisted through everything that life's thrown at them. So knowing that you're not alone is comforting because people have been through what you've been through. And I've also learned that you should never ever give up and keep trying for what your dream is. And my dream was to get these books out in the world. And I did that. So. It's great. So kind of a, a little tangent, but what are, what are your thoughts on the future of space exploration? Well, in Heliopause, I talk about being at the edge of the solar system, Heliopause, and how we have space stations out there. And, you know, basically, and this is very topical at the moment, having like an ultra rich person who has his fingers in a lot of pies deci decides, oh, I'm going to fund these stations, I'm going to fund these projects, and kind of just disappears and messes with a lot of people's lives. But I'm hoping that we don't have that scenario. I hope that we have a little bit better control, you know, over the research that gets done and it doesn't run amok. It doesn't become Weyland Yutani, kind of from Alien and Aliens, you know, universe. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I do see that it's kind of unavoidable that we would have corporate space travel. But what I want to see personally, and I think we have to put it out there, we have to make it happen, is accessibility in space, you know, because for right now, it's not accessible. It hasn't been, you know. We want people of every ability, nationality, gender to be in space yeah. and to have a future there that is a rich one and not a limiting one because it is to us now limitless and we should keep it that way. And we should be careful. This is my ecology degree stepping in and I'm not talking prime director from Star Trek, but I will <laughs> lean into that a little bit. We yeah. have to be extremely careful about what we introduce to the worlds that we visit Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have to be careful, of course, about what might be there as well. So, yeah. so I'm hoping that we, we make, we, we compromise, we do the research, we can maybe profit as well from asteroid mining or whatever we're going to do. But, you know, I, I want us to all work together with this. It's too important. And we are still very small and we don't know what's out there. So I feel like working together is a better idea than going our own way. 
Yeah, I, I definitely think uh, I got those uh, first contact vibes with heliopause, you know, kind of like, you know, is it going to be thing like the Vulcans? Are they going to just go, we got warp core technology and all of a sudden they come along or is it going to be, oh no, there's a crisis. So this is how first contact happens. Or, you know, I, I just thought that was pretty interesting. Thank you. Uh, I That's a fun got, one to play with. Yeah, I definitely got that vibe going there. Um, yeah, and of course, ultimately, it's a very different scenario than what you might've imagined. And mm -hmm. then it kind of becomes more, instead of Star Trek, it's more like Doctor Who. Yeah. Where you have someone who is a protector of Earth. Yeah, I mean, I, I was getting all kinds of different, you know, flashes to different sci-fi things with that, you know? I mean, because Heliopause has a definite feel to it. You know, it, it feels more like, okay, here's, Here's humans, they, they've established themselves in space, but we haven't really gone far out, you know, in heliopause. And then when you get into the next two, I feel like I feel like the next two with, uh, they feel similar-ish, you know, to each other. You've got ephemeris and accretion, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then luminiferous, you just go a completely different way too. So, but I, I, that's kind of how I group them in my head, you know, like, helio, yeah. you know, heliopause is this one part of the story. And then the next two kind of move that action along, get your focus on Galadea and move all that along. And then, oh, dear God. <laughs> and then <laughs> I can't tell him an Everest. <laughs> and yeah, so I, I can like, kind of see that. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the long game is that it's a generational situation, you know, mm -hmm. it's affecting multiple decades of people's individual lives or families' lives and that are all wrapped up together, you know, in events that were beyond their control and they have to work together to to try to stop what's going on. And, you know, and then from there, you know, who knows? But uh, yeah, so I, I wanted them to definitely have different flavors, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then you had you had to find it was interesting. You had to find a way to work with you've got your humans who compared to a lot of these other species are very short lived, you know, right. and finding ways to integrate that and and find ways to to preserve certain timelines to make them all come together. To happen, a lot of them were pretty tragic and weren't intended by the people who were kind of pulling some strings. So no, no, everybody kind of messed up you know, at some <laughs> level. Everybody messed up, you know, that was supposed to kind of get this, get this going, but it, you know, they did their best. So, and it just didn't go the way a lot of them thought it would. And, and you know, that's okay. I think it makes it more interesting, you know, can't, can't predict yeah. everything. Yeah, there's a, there's a line that Galadea says that just basically sums up harshly what she thought of the people, the summoners, you know, who, were like sort of tweaking and, and being puppet masters a little bit behind the scenes. And they really just messed up, you know, really badly. Like they got some parts right, but they messed up so badly otherwise that she just, the, what she says is, and I can't quote it here because it's foul language, but um, <laughs> it basically sums it up, you know, cause like the incredible frustration of being like, quit messing with people's lives, you know, like let us figure this out, you know, you've done enough. Please, yeah. please go away. <laughs> You've done enough damage. <laughs> yeah. We'll take it from here. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what, what do you like to read? Well, I mean, I obviously like to read science fiction and fantasy. I actually like to read a lot of nonfiction. Um, I've like, I've got some things which are kind of related to something I'm working on. I've been reading about asteroids, you know, not, stories but actual factual information and i've always had a thing for rocks and minerals i like reading about those i'm reading about polynesia right now and reading embers of war by gareth l powell and i like to read cookbooks and travel books too which i'm sure you probably noticed that there's a little bit of that slant to oh, the books yes. as well. <laughs> the food, the food in this book is like, that's where you almost makes me think about Redwall. If you've ever read that series, oh, yeah. the fantasy yeah. series, and they always describe these feasts and it's like, oh, that sounds so good. Yeah, maybe, so, maybe we could have a, a cookbook, like the, the recipes from your series. That would that's, be kind of That's cool. been requested. And you know, <laughs> Sumand, Sumand is kind of loosely based off a chef I used to know. Um, mm -hmm. It was going to open a place called Cafe du Monde. Oh, back in the okay. 90s. He was he was an opera singer in San Francisco, flamboyant, outrageously funny, laser sharp wit. You didn't dare cross him, right? <laughs> well, Sum Sumand is kind of channeling that guy. And, you know, I, I learned a lot from listening to him. And, you know, I've, I worked in a restaurant for a few years after college because I had no choice. 
And I always had an interest in food anyway, so I'm always cooking, baking, things like that. So it was inevitable that there would be a lot of food mentioned in these books, each one, you know, so it's a, it's probably going to happen. That point. would be cool. I know that's, yeah. that's been a trend lately with uh, uh, fictional universes and their, their related cookbooks. I think we right. have a few at our house. I think yeah, we have there's... a World of Warcraft one somewhere. And, you know, there's yep. all kinds of interesting so, yeah. ones. But watch out for Strophy liqueur. So. Oh, man. Yeah. Let's we'll be careful with that one. <laughs> it's going to go up on the high up shelf, you know? <laughs> yeah. And make sure it's it's earthquake proof because you don't want it to break because it costs so much. So Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> But that, that can go in the, down in history with the pan-galactic gargle blaster. <laughs> <laughs> I just talked about it with somebody, so that's hilarious. Um, but yeah, like the purple pies, the bulbenberry pies, you know, just mm -hmm. there's all these different things throughout the books. And even just pie, you know, like <laughs> Meredith and her pie. That was her comfort yeah. food. The, the, she had limited resources on Mandira Research Station, so she worked with what she had, you know, and made and whatever treats we could. I feel like some of that ties it together because you know there's there's the the there's the mention of a sundae and chocolate at, at the beginning and near the end and it's like oh yeah you know chocolate yeah. is important you know and <laughs> well, it, yeah and it's kind of it's kind of hilarious that it's Guru that introduces her to chocolate mm -hmm. you know the, and then that she that she can't forget it you know it's like um she's like I, I want some more and you will have to go to Earth for that one. You know? <laughs> Let's make sure Earth doesn't get destroyed. If there's maybe, maybe maybe that's something we have to offer the universe. <laughs> I think it is. I really yeah. do. And you know, that's my my own personal chocoholism at work there. So, yeah. so uh, what what are your next projects you're going to be working on? Well, I have quite a few in the queue, and at various stages, I have some short stories that I've submitted. One of them was accepted in an anthology, and it is a pirate ghost story. Ooh. And I'm not sure when the anthology comes out, so I'll let everybody know when it does. But the, the main protagonist is a, is a girl, you know, she's on vacation at Myrtle Beach, you know, and then, you know, it's, she sees this ghost pirate and there's a whole story there. It's very tragic. And so that's coming out soon. And then I had submitted another one about a library, mm -hmm. actually. So which uh, because I, I do love my librarians. So you are our heroes. I hope you know that. Well, thank and, you. And, you know, I also am working on a near future, as in like not as far in the future as Heliopause, because Heliopause was 23rd century. Um, Sci-fi thriller slash mystery and involving disasters. So that's a very different angle. And, and the psychological stuff in that is a little challenging to deal with for because it's got a it's it's cast is much smaller you know and tighter and what they're going through is just mutual meltdowns you know and having to deal with that there's that i also have a middle grade dark fantasy that's set Ooh. in southern appalachia nice. and that's got an 11 year old protagonist i also have an animal fantasy with talking animals mm -hmm. and i have sort of a campy horror sci-fi that I actually might turn into a screenplay because I think Ooh. it would be good show material, but we'll see. And, you know, and then I started another thing that was sort of um, somebody who read the first chapter said it reminded them of Blake seven. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it's a different kind of more seedy space opera thing, you know, and that's, that's a fun new one. So there's a lot in the pipeline and lots of short stories I plan to get out in the world this year too, because I think they're a lot of fun to write and it's a good way of getting your name out there and just stretching your, you know, flexing your writing muscles, so to speak. Yeah. So that's what's happening. Very cool. Um, uh, what, what advice do you have for aspiring authors? Don't give up. Don't ever give up. Keep writing. You don't have to stick to write every day. I don't agree with that. I don't believe in writer's block. It's okay to take a break and come back when you feel like it. And, you know, sometimes it's good just to kind of switch it up what you're writing. You can journal for a few days. I do that. Sometimes I just write what I saw and what I ate that day. And that's it in my journal. That's it. And somehow that helps me, you know, and also be willing to share. You know, it's it's hard to let go of something, especially an idea that you kept for decades, in my case, or however long. But, you know, the world really needs stories. So mm -hmm. share them. You know, keep working. You can do it. Get out there. Don't ever stop writing. Don't give up and share it with us so we can read it because we want to. 
you never know your book might save somebody, you know, it's. Well, that would be lovely. I like the conversations I've had in private messages about the stories have been really incredibly touching. And, you know, one person said, I hadn't read a book in years till I read your series. And he just read them all back to back, got uh -huh. the newest one, read them all. And I was really touched by that, you know, and then he said that he was going to read them every year from now on. I thought, oh, wow. Well, that's, that's great. You know, I was like getting tears, you know, like, it's wonderful. And, and to have, you know, an established author like Jonathan Mayberry, who blurbed the books, you know, he's read them all and getting his feedback was incredibly fabulous. And, you know, I have taken a lot of lessons from him too, about, you know, how to, how to reach out to your audience and get new readers and things like that. So I feel like any connection I make with the books is a positive one. You know, it just, every review I get, I just, God, you guys read my, my stuff. I love it. You know, <laughs> thank you. You know, no matter what the review says, I'm always grateful because they took the time and that's time out of a person's life that they read the book, that they reviewed it. And I'm just super grateful to make some kind of connection there. Yeah, it, it's been interesting. I know that, you know, we read a lot as librarians. I know, wow, so, so, so shocking. But, uh, you know, the pandemic has kind of affected people's reading habits. You know, some yeah. people said they've had difficulty reading. I know I've just been reading a lot more, uh, you know, and some of it is, some of it's in print and some of it's audio. And I can use that audio as a background to some That's extent. Good. Yeah, I had, I, I couldn't, you know, after my father's death during the pandemic, I, I kind of stopped reading and I was reading Embers of War by Gareth Powell. I've been reading it for like a year and I, I, for a while, I just, I couldn't read fiction at all. I couldn't, mm -hmm. I just couldn't do it. I have a huge to, to be read pile, TBR. Mm -hmm. And, but I started up his book again and I'm, I'm reading it more and more. And now I'm kind of getting towards the finale. So I would just say it's, it's really weirdly affected a lot of us and, there's, there's nothing wrong with whatever we've had to do to cope, you know, as long as it's not hurting us. Right. So right. we're grateful for you librarians reading <laughs> though, you know, when those of us who, who write might be kind of stuck because it affected writing too. You know? Oh, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Strange days. Yes. <laughs> um, would you like to do a reading for us from your books or? Ooh, that would be fun. Do you, do you have a preference for which one? I don't know. I mean, any any one of them, really. Uh, All right. Let me take a look. Let's see. Because I don't, I have to be careful with limited right. effort because it's so spoilery. Yeah. You might, you might want to do something from Heliopause. All right. Let me see here. Let me see. Let's see what I can find. Bear with me. Okay. All right. Here we go. Efren then reached for the amethyst pendant on his chest. Here, he said, and he pulled the gem up and touched Forster's temple with it. The oddness of the action threw Forster for a moment, and he had just enough time to say, the pain's gone, when Efren withdrew the stone and pulled Forster over to his desk. I need to show you something, he said, and he brought up Forster's screen. An image appeared, and Forster cried out. It was Spears. Spears, his friend, who had been hale and blustering and jolly and more full of life and vigor than anyone else. This image now in front of him could not be Spears. Forster refused to accept it. Whoever this was curled it into an unnatural shape. His arms clenched in fists in front of his face. This was not Spears. This man whose face seemed carved in a frozen and incredible pain screamed in silence, a man warped by and trapped in agony. What is this? cried Forster. That's Spears. Yes, it is. Don't look away. Efren grabbed him and stood him in front of the screen. Look, take a good long look. Forster's heart hammered in fear and revulsion, yet he did as he was told. Is he dead? As I said before, he is not. How are we seeing this? I have ways, said Efren. Forster covered his mouth and nose and peered over his fingers. Why show me? Efren bent his face to Forster at eye level, within centimeters and hissed, you need to see this. You need to understand. This is what has happened to your friend. He is trapped in suffering and he is beyond our reach. If he could choose, he would wish to die. Everyone on this station is at risk. This could happen to all of us. How? Not, not Ariel is what I'm unsure of, Forster. I don't want this to be true, but we must take precautions. Forster Gibbons knows this. What? Forster gasped. Why would he be so interested in these signals of yours? Why involve his Veronica? Yes, I do know her name as well, Efren nodded. In fact, I feel better learning more about this Veronica. 
that may be one weakness and we should use it. Stop, stop right there. What the hell are you talking about? And then forced to remember the first code translation and went cold. Changed me, feared me. Efren saw Forster's face fall. What? Forster snapped. Can't you read minds? And Efren actually tilted his shiny head back and guffawed. Ah, Forster, I'm not that skilled, I'm afraid. Wouldn't want to be. I'm just asking. The signal, the code, Gibbons, or Veronica translated, it said, changed me, feared me. Efren inhaled rapidly, and that one gesture shook Forster to his core. Oh, shit, what now? It's Ariel. It has to be, Efren said quickly. He loped to the door. I need to go. Are you telling Meredith? Forster asked. They stared at each other. Not yet. I have something I need to do. And Efren stopped and turned back. Forster, take a break. You've more than earned it. I'll be in touch. The door shut. Forster didn't need to be told twice. He his hair and left for the bar. So there we see end of what the enemy, Payash Johan, does to people. It traps them in suffering and keeps them alive. I, I was definitely having a Battlestar Galactica moment with the whole Veronica red dress sort oh. of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so that was fun. And, yeah, uh, she like if you were to find somebody that looked like Veronica, be Sid Charisse in the bandwagon mm -hmm. with Frank Sinatra. The way she looks, it's just that's Veronica to me, just like, yeah, you know, very sultry, very sultry, very sexy woman, you know, super yeah. tall, violet eyes, dark hair, you know, and then, you know, model type person. So, mm -hmm. which Ariel responds to, you know, but that's a whole nother story. Right. There, there are many elements there that I like about that. Um, and my, my husband plays the Mass Effect video games, and he, he oh, definitely yeah. was seeing seeing some of that with the with the plot lines and stuff. So. Yeah, no, I, you know, I've not ever played it. I don't even know the plots, but I've had a few people say, hey, this character reminds me of Mass Effect. And I'm like, well, that's cool, because I, mean, I know people enjoy it. So if yeah, there's some like playing through, that's cool. Yeah, because like there's a lot of situations where you're looking like at a map of going to different planets and stuff like that. And I was imagining like that kind of thing. And memories, junctions yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Cool. And the junctions were partly influenced by Contact with okay, Jodie yeah. Foster and Carl Sagan. So it's kind of like that. Um, which I loved that. I loved the movie, especially with Jodie, because she she was really perfect. And I kind of felt like her as a kid. You know, I was always a, the nerd out looking at the stars at night and teaching my friends about astronomy, but um, I chose to go into life science and I don't have any regrets there, so. Yeah. All right, does, does anybody in our audience have any questions they'd like to ask? Can either turn on your microphones or type in the chat. Hi. Um, I just wanted to know uh, what was your favorite scene in the um, in the series to write. Ooh, that's a good question. There's there's several. Uh, there's a lot in Luminiferous, a lot. And so, trying not to spoil it, maybe I should go back to Ephemeris. So I think probably my favorite scene in Ephemeris is 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 Galadea being taken to the planet Rickaloy, and she's up in the asteroid castle looking down at the planet below and there's the two moons in the sky. I loved that scene because she's, she feels very stressed out. She's only been around robots her whole life. And here she is with this smoldering enigmatic mage, you know, with silver eyes and silver hair and smells like very pleasant smoke. And she's, it's almost like she's, she could swoon and fall right off into that planet below. But she realizes that she's, She's somewhere else and her life is changing by the second. I really loved that one. But there's a scene in Luminiferous that seems very real to me because some of those scenes were written decades ago, in which there's Gendu's boarding house, which is this ancient stone structure in a city of gleaming towers. You know, it's this little hidden stone building. It's round. I even have architectural designs of it that I did when I was a kid. So, you know, I, I really love that when you walk into there, there's Phyron crystals, which are these, they, they create heat and light, especially if you dip them in water. So they're in the sconces and, and when you walk in, the floors creak and pop and, you can, and the hallways curve around and you can tell it's been there for many, many centuries and it's so out of place. You don't know where you're at, but you feel like you're in a fairy tale when you're there. And uh, the basement of course is full of laboratories and, and potions and things like that and fire and crystals flaming everywhere. So I, I loved those scenes a lot. And I loved any scene with Nalag the Dean Gein, which was, you know, 
you know, telepathic animal that looks a lot like a fox uh, and has huge violet eyes and fluffy tail, tall pointy ears. And it's a, t it's a telepath, so it can read your thoughts. Um, and the animals work in concert with each other, you know, while they hunt and other things mentally. And they can communicate with some people, even if those people can't quite communicate with them. But once uh, Nalag meets actual telepaths, you know, that's it's a unique bond, you know. So those are fun scenes that I really love to write. And I actually really liked the sort of the finale, you know, it was so insane that I was like, this is like a heavy metal cover, you know, which is <laughs> <laughs> kind of what I was going for. You know, it's like, I wanted to just be absolutely insane. What all was happening in a short period of time and visually, Good luck to somebody who ever tries to adapt that because I, <laughs> there's a lot going on there. Like Ashtonen alone is would be uh, one of the readers said that was really cinematic to him, like approaching Ashtonen. And then everything that happens after that is just insane. So, yeah, those were favorites. But I loved all of it, to be honest. So, yeah, that, that ending had me getting some like almost Guardians of the Galaxy vibes going on, just like on a massive scale. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, I have all kinds, but I don't want to do any spoilers, so. <laughs> I know, so you and I will have to talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll be considerate to our audience that hasn't read it yet. <laughs> Gareth, did you have a question? Can't hear you. Unmute. Gareth, we can't hear you. There yeah. you go. Yeah. I, I was trying to think of something that wouldn't um, mean you had to give any spoilers. So, yeah, <laughs> um, right. It's hard, I know. Yeah. It's hard talking about a four book series without. Uh... It's doable. We can do it. Um, of all the characters in, in the, the series, which one do you think is most like yourself? Oh, well, I, I mean, both Forster and Gala are a lot like me because Forster has a lot of regrets. You know, he's in his 40s. He has had disastrous relationship history. Um, and he, he, wants, he wants so badly to help people that he often sacrifices his own happiness to do that. And, you know, Anna just puts it to him straight, you know, you need to, you need to be happy yourself before you can be happy with someone else. And that's very true. And so I identified a lot with him and his flaws and his desires and his dreams of Oregon and things like that, where he, he just wanted to be, he wanted to make a difference, but he also kind of didn't want to be saddled with a big bunch of responsibility, you know, but, you know, his fate is very interesting. That's all I'll say there. And Gala, is really at first a spoiled brat having lived an isolated life you know with a bunch of robots and then she meets Ariad and her life very rapidly changes and then she goes through a, decades of traumatic history on the planet Biddick being tortured and she doesn't remember a lot of that time so she comes out of that very changed but the minute she meets Kane her first human experience you know and he's he's just this guy you know like hangs out in his cabin in the woods, you know, and that's her first experience is just this casual guy. He and his husband brew beer and, you know, she tries beer. So like, I, what I like about Gala is that she is very flawed and tempestuous and she is passionate. So there's a lot of me there. So it's, you know, I think both Gala and Forster, I'm, I'm like both of them most, and but there's little bits of me here and there. There's bits of me in Ariel and her regrets and her worries um, about messing things up, you know. And um, and then you know Meredith and Deming uh, both really like to craft and bake, mm -hmm. so that's they also have a little bit of me as well. But yeah, mostly mostly Gala and Forster are the two most similar, and of course they're the main characters. So thank you. Thank you. I, th I think I'd like to hang out with a lot of your characters. <laughs> Who would you want to hang out in a bar with the most? Oh, oh Guru, hands down. Dude, yes. Yeah. 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 Guru the best. <laughs> like, I love him so much that, you know, 
he is just the coolest. I don't know if you've seen the art that I had made for him. I, I saw I, a little bit on your website. Yeah, so there's a Tongan artist. I was trying to find a Maori artist because mm -hmm. Guru is Maori. Okay. Of Maori descent. Mm -hmm. And I found a Tongan artist who said, you know, our cultures are pretty similar. He knew very well, you know, the Polynesian culture. And and we had a lovely, really fabulous discussion. And, and he loved Guru and he identified with him very much. And there is more to Guru than meets the eye, which we will learn eventually. You know, like I want to talk about him some more. And in a way, he's kind of the Duncan Idaho I can of the Questers on Saga, you know, and especially his loyalty and his badassery and his coolness. Yeah. And he's always, he's so keen. He doesn't have any, you know, he starts out like just a normal guy at the bar. He's got a botany history. So, you know, when you're on Mandir Research Station, you kind of need multiple backgrounds to be able to do something that far out in space when you don't get any, you know, refreshments, you yeah. know, freshening up station uh, deliveries that often. Um, so he's incredibly versatile, but he just is a cool guy. You know, yeah. he's like the perfect right hand man. Yeah, he, he's the guy I would want on my zombie apocalypse team. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He would be the guy. Number one. Yeah. Yep. And then who would you, who would you like to just, you know, instead of like a bar, like who would you, who would you want to hang out with like, and just talk with for a while? Hmm. You know, I don't, I wonder if it would be Jindu. Jindu. Jindu, yeah, because yeah. he knows, you know, what, like, there's so many questions everything. I would want to ask him, just. He knows you know, everything. Yep. <laughs> he knows all the things, you know. Well, yes, well, yeah. You know, like he, he really is, you know, very frustrating, you know, to the characters because he yeah. he doesn't just give you that information. But yeah, if you could pick in Deuce Brain, you'd know a lot about the galaxy, you know. And then um, who would you want, like if you could, let's think about this one. Um, so if you could, if you could fall in love with one of them, who would it be? It'd probably be Deming. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you can tell. Yeah. Yeah. I you love Deming a lot. You know, he's, well, especially as an empath for one thing. So, I mean, yeah. And then, you know, yeah. just the, the cooking skills and, you know, the gardening and the, you know, and just, you know, everything there. He can do a lot. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Sailing, you know, sampling and, you yeah. know, He's definitely a good person to be with at the end of the world. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I love him a lot. And like, he's been in my mind for decades too. So a lot of these characters seem so real to me that, you know, it's just, it, it's, it, it's a really strange feeling, you know, you feel like you know them and you kind of wish that they were real, you know? Yeah. I wish he were real, Guru, Nalag. Yeah. Just, Nalag would be at my feet yes. all the time. I would be petting Nalag. Yes. You know, um, <laughs> Beetle, I love a lot too. Oh yes, yeah. and that's very Oz. That is such an Oz thing because there's you know like in the Oz there's the Wogglebug, mm -hmm. and um, although Wogglebug is kind of snobby, Beetle's much nicer. Beetle, Beetle's like just so I feel like Beetle's enthusiasm is so genuine, especially when there's children. Sure. You know, it's yeah. Just, <laughs> I know. It's like oh, new larva. You know, <laughs> I love happy. That. I know. <laughs> yeah, I think Beetle and Nalag are, and Dimming are big favorites, I think, mm -hmm. of a lot of readers so far. So it'll be interesting to see over time who different people respond to. Mm -hmm. So it's really fun. And it just, you know, it makes me feel really happy that people bond with those characters. Yeah. Yeah. What, so Ariad, what mm -hmm. do you think about Ariad? That was a that was a hard one, you know. I mean, because you know, at first, uh, of course, you don't know who he is really, and and then you kind of run into him. And for me, you know, at, at first, I was thinking before I, you know, when I just had read Heliopause, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, my brain is comparing to like Vulcan First Contact, because you've got this like much more advanced being, you know, that is guiding humans sort of concept, and you know, it was it was hard for me to decide how I felt. Like he was he's he's a complex character in terms mm -hmm. of like oh i'm happy that he's happy and then oh oh geez wait no maybe that was a little toxic oh oh maybe not i don't know it's this very <laughs> yeah <laughs> he keeps you on your toes yeah incredibly flawed person you know and i then... would say that it depends on the book i'm reading at the time how i feel about him in this yeah that's, that's that's pretty true yeah <laughs> yeah 
And then his own history, I'll delve a little bit more into that one day too, because that was a late introduction. It was hinted at in Accretion, mm -hmm. you know, between when he was talking to Paul and, uh, sorry, um, Cain and Rez. Mm -hmm. they, they, you know, he had hinted there was a history there that he hadn't really spoken about. So yeah. there's definitely more to him still, you know, like what was he like then? That's what happens when you live for centuries. <laughs> yep. Yep. So he's, he's definitely, you can't really pigeonhole him into any one cookie cutter thing at all. No, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. But yeah, so thanks for writing the books. They're great. Thank you for reading them. <laughs> yeah, I, for I'm really happy they're out in the world. I'm happy that you guys have them. That means yep. so much to me because I spent so much of my youth in Kingsport Public Library mm -hmm. with my dad. He would bring me from Gray driving to Kingsport and we would hang out for hours and I would get this big stack of books. You know, that's where I got all the Oz books. That's where I got Robin McKinley's The Hero in the Crown, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the Damar series there and all the Lord of the Rings books that I didn't already have, Yeah, you know, and just a wonderful, wonderful resource that really changed my life for the better growing up in East Tennessee. So thank you, Kingsport Library. Thank you. Um, thank you. And thank you people for coming and um, thank you posting this for people to watch after the fact and great just, just thanks for coming and everybody thank have a great you. evening yeah all right thank you so much and mm -hmm. ad astra ad astra thank you to everybody else who came i really appreciate you ad astra to you as well and au revoir <laughs>